Okay, that was a big chunk of learning all in one recording, but uh, or one lesson. Uh, but now we're on to step two. This one is much more succinct, and we shouldn't take near as long to get through it. Uh, but I just want to point out before I go on, I made mention of this business of the HTTPS, right? If you're really frustrated, you're having trouble, you accidentally didn't click the right thing, and so now you know your browser just refuses to process it with a secure connection, doesn't trust certificate, click the little drop down. You can always just select HTTP, right? And in that way you can bypass the whole system for now, uh, the whole uh, secure connection issue for now, and that should help you get along and uh, get your work done, right? So that's another option for you. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at HTTPS so for now. And I just want to review, as it says here, now look at some of the issues we have. For example, here, we've got so many columns, right? And, you know, this is taking up a lot of room, showing the first name, middle name, last name, all separately. Plus, you know, you know, picture this up in the doctor's office on the screen. Well, this is pretty critical private information. A person's OHIP number is not something you want to share with just anybody, right? So, you know, there's some stuff on the screen here. You might want to move off of the index or find a more concise way to put it and so on. Look at the phone number. That's an ugly way to show the phone number as well. Okay, the date of birth is there. That's okay. But, you know, that's, again, highly personal information. How often do you get asked that as part of, you know, identifying yourself, uh, you know, to somebody or something? So you don't really want that shown here up on the index page all the time for everyone to see. Plus... Remember I said, we'll eventually get to implementing the identity system. So we can have different security requirements based on roles or claims. So, you know, maybe the you know, person sitting in front of the screen looking at the index has the right to see certain information, but they aren't even allowed to go to uh, the details or delete. So they can never see the date of birth and the OHIP number, right? So that's why we might show some information here instead. Maybe it's okay, for example, to show the age on this page. But to see the actual date of birth would require a higher security authentication before they can go to any of the other pages, right? Okay, all right, so uh, we'll leave that at that, and then we'll start looking at how we might implement some of those things, issues we were just talking about. So I'm going to close all these tabs so we don't have the screen cluttered up to begin with. Now, what we can do is let's come back down to the actual models themselves, right? So I'm going to start here with the patient class. These are the sort of the key properties that relate to the database data that we're actually storing. But we can have summary properties here as well. That's what they're often referred to, right? I can have properties here that just take information available from the actual entity properties and massage it, change it, manipulate it in some way or another, right, to make it available to use in the user interface Okay. It won't get stored in the database, not unless I make special effort to do so, and I usually don't. Right? Uh, it's just used inside uh, the controller itself to help us present information in a user-friendly way. So let me copy my code here and get it in place, and we'll walk through it together. Now, I usually put everything after the primary key, right? So I'll throw it up here near the top, though. That's where I think summary properties should go. Please follow that practice. So I'm not searching up and down your class to find your summary properties. I know they're going to be right at the top under the primary key. So this is a version okay, of the basically what we would normally call a full name. But I often like to have a common property called simply summary in most of my entity classes so that I can count on, hey, what piece of information kind of summarizes this entity? Right? In this case, I think the full name probably is good enough. Sometimes we'll combine additional properties. You know, uh, Maybe it was important to show the full name dash age in a given type of uh, application and so on. So I might change it there. But I think here as a summary, the full name is good enough. So I have the first name. I'm taking with the middle initial, as long as it's not null. Okay? I take the first uh, letter, make sure that I capitalize it, and put a period space after it, okay? And that is what's going in for the middle name, and then finally the last name. Age, right? Taking my date of birth, which of course is nullable, extracting the uh, year, month, day, pulling all that together to determine the age, right? Uh, this is just one of the many ways to calculate it, but this one always works, right? So 
I've stuck with it for a long time. By the way, if I just check here right away, if the date of birth is null, does it return null for the age, right? But if it's not null, then I do the actual calculation and return the age uh, to stringing it, and away we go. Here's a summary, okay? If I want to show the age and then in brackets the date of birth, right? That might be useful if somebody has permission to see the date of birth in our security system later on. In, instead of just showing the date of birth, <laughs> Why make them do the mental calculation? Show them both, right? There we go. So that'll be that one. And here's just my phone. So I'm just taking that 10-digit string and separating it out with brackets and dashes and so on, as we normally see a, a formatted phone number. So those are all of my summary properties that I'm doing here, right? Summary properties for the doctor? Sure. We've got the name compo component at least. Right, so at the very least, I'm going to want to have the same sort of, you know, formal name and full name, okay, as a summary here, as well, right? Formal name, by the way, that's last name, comma, first name, middle initial, right? We had that in both. It's very often useful for things like if you're going to actually show the data in a ordered list, right? Then doing it by last name, full name, uh, or sorry, last name, first name, etc., is a nice way to do that. Okay. So we have that inside here. I don't have a, I'll probably never actually need a display name for that. I could add one if I find I need to later on. All right, so those are two issues. Now we have a number of fixes to do in the user interface itself, okay? So by the way, summary properties, because they only use the existing entity properties or actually data properties, there's never a need for a migration just because you added summary properties. It's just presenting the information in a different way. Now we can come over to my various UI fixes. So I'm going to start focusing on patient, right? So if I come to the views for patient, okay, uh, in the patient index, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take the OHIP number off altogether. Remember, we've got the head region and then the actual, we loop through for each row of the body of the table. So I'll have to do this in both. I'll take it out of the head and come down to the body and I'll take it out of here inside the for each loop. So that just gets OHIF off the page. You know what? I'm going to do the same with my expected yearly visits. Okay, that's something that doesn't have to be up there. That's something if I want to see the details of the patient and I have permission to do so, I might come in and do that there. Helps unclutter the index a little bit, getting those off. Now, speaking of uncluttering it, instead of having three separate columns for first, middle, and last name, I'm just going to show my Summary, right? And that lets me get rid of three columns down to one. Make sure I do the same thing down here. And get rid of the middle and last name columns because I'll just show that full name, that summary property instead. Okay, let's talk about date of birth. Age, okay? We're going to show that right on this index page but we don't want to show the details of the date of birth. So that's a good improvement to the UI. And the phone number, right? Let's make that phone formatted instead. By the way, for the uh, headers, I could have left it up here to phone because it's the same information that's going to appear on the screen either way. The most important one is down here that I make sure I actually display the phone formatted, right? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, last thing. Remember, we noticed this, that the doctor were showing the first name, right? When it built this code or scaffolded this code for us, basically it just looked, he says, I don't know what property you want to show here. We know we have our doctor. We want to show some property about the doctor. So it just went with the first one it found, which was first name. But we added a summary property, right? So we'll show that instead. Again, the green squiggly underline is just a uh, possibility of a null reference. In case we didn't include the actual doctor object in the patient, then we won't actually have a, anything to show here, right? But that's okay. It's just a warning. We can live with that. All right, so that's all the changes I'm going to make, at least for now, on the actual index view. Okay, now on the details view. 
right? Remember what this looks like. Okay, just as a list here, a DL, a description list, showing all the details, the values in each and every property, just sort of in a column here, right? So here, yes, of course, we're going to still show the uh, OHIP number. All, everything should always be on the details view, right? But, you know, instead of the date of birth, let's do that uh, other summary property, the age summary, which will show the date of birth as well. It saves the person from trying to have to mentally calculate the age by the date of birth itself, right? Phone, just to show you that I don't need to change both, I'll just change the one that actually is the display for. Display name, okay, uses the name of the property or if we've given it a display name attribute, it will use it, right? Display for actually sets it up using all the hints we've given about the data type and everything else, creates the proper HTML to display it, right? Okay, using any display name we've given as well. And of course, the doctor, once more, is just showing the first name. We'll change that to the summary. All right, now let's go to the delete view. Basically, the exact same three changes. We're going to show age summary. We're going to show form formatted. And, of course, the doctor, the summary. Okay. So most of the changes were on these three, but we're not quite done yet, okay? Uh, remember, maybe I should run it once more and point out the issues we're going to talk about next. Okay, once more, coming to patients. There, that looks a lot better, right? Much less cluttered. The patient column is nicely there with that summary field. We're just showing the age, the phone number's formatted, okay? Then doctor, now we're showing a proper full name for the doctor as well. And we see on details and so on, we're getting nice uh, presentation here of the information that we need, right? Notice that the coverage works fine here and back on the index, right? But if I go into edit or create, then here's where we're starting to see some additional issues, okay? Coverage, there's nothing showing. Our enumeration isn't visible there. Ooh, our doctor drop-down list is still showing just the first name. And you know what? It's not even alphabetical in order, okay? Even if you only have a few items, as a general rule, drop-down lists should all, or any kind of list, should always be in some sort of order to help you, you know, type the first letter even and jump at least that far uh, to the proper selection that you're after, right? So there's a few issues here as well, okay? And you know what else? Suppose the coverage, like, let me go back to the list for a second. Right here, Jane Doe, okay, is out of province. When I come into edit, if I were to take this OHIP number out, because after all, they're out of province, even though it's not showing it at the moment, I'm going to get, you cannot leave the OHIP number blank. Oh, I didn't think of that, did I? Yeah, I added my coverage, but the fact is I have an absolutely required OHIP number for every patient, but not every patient is going to have an OHIP number. Hmm, that's going to be an issue I need to address as well. All right. Okay, you see the coverage is not being provided as well. So we're getting all these error messages. Let me go back to the list for a second. If I click Create New, if I just click Create, Here's all the validation that's happening, okay? You cannot leave the OHIP number blank, first name, last name can't be blank, right? Uh, cannot leave the number expecting you to leave visits blank, and so on and so on. Phone number's required. You must select patient's health coverage. Now, we do have a doctor selected, <laughs> which is probably not something we actually want, right? As a general rule, when you're creating, when you're creating a record, we usually want to make sure we force the user not to leave something that's a default here for the selected primary care physician, right? We don't want them to have Gregory House get every new patient, right? We want to force them to actually make the effort of selecting a doctor, right? So that's kind of the opposite situation we have of all the others. The other thing I'll maybe mention just before we go on is notice that these messages all came up client side. 
we weren't actually even allowed. I can click create here to my heart's content. You'll never see the little spinner spin up here. It didn't. It's actually being prevented from even submitting, even though this is a submit button. It's being prevented from submitting based on the local validation that can be done here, right? If I view source, view page source here, right? Let's come down and have a look at some of these. Look at, okay, so here's our OHIP number. Input class, form control, da, da, da. data value true, but, okay, data value length. There's my error message, right? Length is 10, regex, okay, and so on and so forth. There's the actual regex. So all this is being given with these data value attributes in the HTML. So jQuery is able to use that and perform all that validation locally. We're telling it what it needs to know to do this locally before it actually submits back to the server. So the majority of this validation is all happening here. Now, sometimes some things can't happen okay, by jQuery. There's only so much it can do. For example, suppose we were violating a unique constraint. Well, that even has to wait till we actually try it in the database. But you know, there's an intermediate step as well that we can send the data to the server once all the local validations are happy, and then even there do some additional checks before we send it to the database. So there's three in the end, three spots where we actually do validation. If, it, if the local browser supports it, okay, then we can take advantage of the ability to do it on the client side before it's even submitted. Then when we get the code in the controller, okay, then we can uh, do some further validation there, and then we can try to send it to the database, and then if the database has an objection, that's the third level that validation happens. All right, so let's address the issues that we've talked about so far. So we have some changes to make. One is the fact that the uh, uh, select on a create page for the dropdown list doesn't give us or force us to choose a patient. So let's bring up the create page. Let's look at how the select works here, right? Here's the select for our doctor, okay? We have our label for the doctor ID, then we have a select ASP for doctor ID. We get our items collection from our view bag. We looked at this already, the view bag is that way to actually just put key value pairs into the special view data or view bag, and then we can use it inside the actual HTML of the page to provide that data. Okay, that's our items collection, right? That comes from our controller. If we come to the patient controller, let's come down to the create, right? Here is where we're adding into the select list, okay? into our view data called doctor ID, okay? It's a select list. Our link query just goes and gets all the doctors, okay? Notice the uh, parameters here, the data value field, okay? And the uh, data text field. So the value field is the ID, so that'll be the value of each option in the select list. And the data text field is what is displayed, right? That's why we're seeing first name, because that's a problem with the select list. And the link query itself doesn't apply any order by, right? It's just context dot doctor. Just goes and gets all the doctors from that DB set. So we could fix this up here, this line of code, to provide the full name or the summary, okay? Or actually the formal name would be the best choice because it's last name comma first name and apply a uh, order by to the uh, link query itself. But you notice it happens here it happens here as well. The only difference is now we're also passing an argument, okay, there's a different overload here, a selected value, right? So the patient foreign key value for doctor ID will be the selected one because now we actually have something to work with. Same thing down here on both the edit get and the edit post, right? So this line of code basically in one variation or another occurs four times throughout our controller. So if I update it in one spot and forget another, that's a problem. So it's a good practice to consolidate code that gets repeated like that, okay, into a single block of code. So that's something we're going to do right here, right? I'm going to create a method. I'm just going to call populate dropdown list, right? I'm going to leave it as plural because in many cases we might have more than one 
right? We might have more than one foreign key. In fact, we're going to be adding more foreign keys to the patient class as time goes on. So I'll put all the code for populating all of them in one place. Now, to do this, I need to have the patient object, okay? But it might be null if I'm in a create. I don't have a patient yet. So that's why I have it set up as a nullable patient, okay, defaulted to null, right? Here's my link query, okay? For I only have the one right now, so it's just hard-coded in here, context.doctors, order by last name and first name. Notice that this one, this example, just because I hardly ever use it, <laughs> is in that query expression syntax, the syntax that kind of looks like SQL, right? Okay, except the from clause is first and the select comes at the end, right? But that's my query. And then I pass that here as I build the select list. That's my query. Again, the ID is the data value field. The formal name is my data text field. And then my selected value, because it's a nullable patient, I use the lambda operator here, right? And, uh, sorry, I use the Elvis operator, right? It looks like Elvis, the two eyes with the curl of his hair on his forehead. Anyway, to handle a null patient, getting the doctor ID only if it isn't null. All right, and that puts the same information into view data that I had before. So now all I need to do is call populate dropdown lists in each of those four locations. Okay, let's go to the top first. So in my create get, right? I just, instead of this, call populate dropdown lists with nothing, okay? Because I don't have a patient yet, right? So I'll put that here, come down to the next occurrence here in the uh, post for create. The difference is I actually do have a patient object. So I pass it to make sure that when this select list appears on the create page, now that I have a patient, that the previously selected value is the one selected in the drop-down list, right? So this is the exact code that I'm going to put in the other two occurrences of creating a select list for both the get and the post of edit. We always have an existing value, so we pass the patient object. Okay, so that's good. So now I'll come back here to the create page. So now when it goes and gets the data for my select list, it will be sorted alphabetically in order and show the formal name, last name, comma, first name of the doctor. But I'm not quite done with the change I want to make. Remember, we wanted to force the user to make a selection, right? Not just leave it as the first one that's there by default. So we can do that by adding a, um, a hard-coded value in the select <laughs> option value. An empty string will basically give null, okay, which will be identified as, nope, that's not a valid value. Select a doctor. So that will always be at the top of the list here on the create page. I'm not going to do that on the edit page because, you know, they've already selected a doctor. If I want to pick a different one, I'll pick a different one, right? I don't need to worry about being prompted to make sure I select one. That's really important here for the create process. But now it's possible... <laughs> that they might not pick a doctor yet. So something missing here that you see in all these others, this span for validation, right? Validation four, right? This is the one that actually then shows those red messages. We saw them a minute ago, those red messages that appear on the page to say, hey, there's a validation issue here, right? Well, I don't have one here, so that's okay. I can simply add one. It'll be just the same as all the others. The only thing that really changes is the validation for argument, right? So I'll just put it here right under the select. Span validation for doctor ID, right? And then the class here just makes it red text dash danger as a bootstrap class. Okay, so that should fix that issue. Now, the other thing is my coverage. Okay, remember we had no value showing for my enumeration. Well, this is actually fairly simple. I don't even need a select list, right, for my uh, select. All I do is for the actual select, I just add an items collection, but I say, hey, guess what? Go get the enum select list for coverage, right? And it will generate a select list based on the enumeration named coverage, and away it goes. So that's nice and simple, actually. Now, I need to do that on both the create and on the edit view. So let me bring up the edit view. 
come down here to coverage, put the exact same code in here. So now I have data for the select list here, right? Okay. All right. Now, if you want, you know, if that's scrolling off the page and bothering you, I would just go like that. Okay. Maybe I'll do that on both. Oh. All right. Then we can see it all on the screen as well. Okay. So that's good. So now we have our coverage. Now, the only thing we haven't done yet, but that's coming up in a lesson down the road, is dealing with the issue of the fact that right now I have to have an OHIP number for everybody, even if they don't have one, right? Yes, so that's on my to-do list for the future. In the meantime, let's just see the changes to the UI that we've made so far when I click Create New, right? Now I have my drop-down list. The default is OHIP. I'm forced to select a doctor, right? And... Notice this, I do get my error message here. Locally, you must select a primary care physician. If I don't actually choose one, once I do, then that message goes away, right? So we'll still have to deal with the issue of I can't leave an OHIP number blank if it is OHIP or even if it's not. If it's international, I shouldn't need an OHIP number, and yet I'm going to have to there. So we'll deal with that in a lesson coming up. Just reminding you, call me to task if I forget to cover it but don't worry, I won't forget. Okay, so that's our UI improvements.